Hello, and thank you very much for joining us today on this webinar. Um, I'm the moderator today. My name is Marina Salvadori, and I'm the clinical lead um, of COVID-19 with the Public Health Agency of Canada. I would like to welcome you today on behalf of the Public Health Agency of Canada and Thrombosis Canada, and we're doing a webinar on the diagnosis, treatment, and reporting of vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia associated with um, the AstraZeneca vaccine. We would like to thank the National Collaborating Centre for Infectious Diseases for their support in hosting today and making this webinar possible. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to mention. Um, we are running this webinar through Zoom. You can find the link in the email you received from Eventbrite. If you have technical problems with the Zoom, there is an email on the screen and NCCID will do their best to assist you. Today's event is live and it is being recorded. The recording and the presentation slides will be available on the NCCID website and on Thrombosis Canada website after the webinar. So um, I would like to say that um, it's my great pleasure to uh, invite Dr. Menica Pai, who is a hematologist and thrombosis physician in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, she's head of the service of benign hematology at Hamilton Health Sciences Center associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at McMaster University, and quality lead for transfusion medicine in the Hamilton Regional Laboratory Medicine Program. She's a member of Ontario's COVID-19 Science Advisory Table and co-chairs its Clinical Practice Guideline Working Group. I'd like to say it's really an honor that so many experts and world-class leaders in thrombosis work in Canada, and in particular at McMaster. Um, they were at the forefront of helping others uh, in, in Europe uh, figure out some of the pathophysiology, the diagnosis, and have been contributing in New England Journal of Medicine articles on this syndrome. Dr. Pai and her group have also been helping across the country with clinical care guidelines and helping clinicians diagnose uh, and appropriately manage this syndrome. And their laboratory is also world-class and has um, been serving as um, the center in Canada where um, confirmatory tests are being done. So welcome Dr. Pai and over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Salvatore. Thank you for that kind introduction. It's really my honor to be here today and to speak to folks coast to coast about VIT, uh, vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia uh, following the AstraZeneca and Covishield COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, first, I'll say that I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So today we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about VIT uh, talk about its suspected pathophysiology, uh, but also the rapid identification of the syndrome. We're going to dig a little deeper into testing, and then we're going to talk about how to treat it. And I'm going to close with some of the areas and questions that we're still exploring around this newly described syndrome. So let's start with a case. Now, this is not a real patient, but it's a composite of the many cases that have been reported in the last few weeks. So this is a 56-year-old woman who received her first dose of the Covishield vaccine 12 days ago at her local pharmacy. She presents to her family physician with a severe headache. It's gone on for two days. Nothing seems to be helping. The headache is so bad that she feels nauseous. Concerningly, this morning, she developed blurred vision and diplopia. Her personal medical history, her family medical history, entirely unremarkable. She has two adult children and lives at home with her partner. Her presenting platelet count from a routine CBC that was done in the emergency department shows dramatically low platelets all the way down to 31. There are no other abnormalities on the blood film. The patient is obviously ill. So your question as her clinician is what's going on and does the vaccine that she received have anything to do with it? VIT is a newly described syndrome with three key features. First, patients have blood clots, generally in unusual sites like the cerebral veins or the portal circulation, though they can appear in any arterial or venous territory. They also have thrombocytopenia, usually quite significant, and patients are generally healthy before presentation. There is no signal of affected patients having previous blood clots, a family history of blood clots, or thrombophilias. But even if they were in good health before, 
somewhere between 20 to 60% of reported cases, many of whom presented before we could even speculate about the early detection or treatment of it, actually passed away. The syndrome's in onset is quite stereotyped. So between four and 28 days following vaccination symptoms appear. And this time frame gives us a really important clue as to what is driving VIT. Now, at the right of your screen, this is not a diagram of VIT's pathophysiology. It's actually a diagram of an analogous condition that you might be familiar with called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. In HIT, some patients who receive heparin as a blood thinner develop antibodies to a complex of heparin and platelet factor 4. Platelet factor 4 is a small positively charged molecule that normally sits inside the granules of platelets. Now the antibodies, which are to the complex of platelet factor 4 and heparin, start to stick to platelets and they activate them. The end result is that platelets get switched on, they start to stick together and a coagulation storm begins. The platelet count falls as activated platelets are rapidly cleared and blood clots or thromboses start to form in venous or arterial territories. Now in VIT, there is no heparin in the mix. Patients did not receive it prior to developing the syndrome. There is no heparin in the vaccine, but we see very similar antibodies that have developed to platelet factor four. And the end result, this coagulation storm with activated platelets and detectable antibodies is the same. If your jurisdiction uses the AstraZeneca or the Covishield COVID-19 vaccines, it's really essential that you're aware of it and that you have some level of comfort diagnosing and managing it. Now, there's a number of really excellent living guidance documents that address this uh, from our colleagues in the UK, uh, in Germany, and, and most recently a group from the Netherlands. But today I'm actually going to be focusing on our guidance from Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table. And that's because it's really uniquely tailored to the Canadian context. The other reason I think it's important for us to talk about is because it has input not just from hematologists like me, but also from public health experts, um, internists, family physicians, and emergency medicine physicians. So we tried to create something that really captures the clinical care of it uh, right from patient presentation onto treatment. Now, one note as we move forward, I'm going to be using the term VIT, vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, throughout this presentation. Uh, the science table document is going to be updated in the, the coming days, but currently it reflects the old name, which is a, a tongue twister called VIPIT, but the, the, the terms VIT and VIPIT at this time are interchangeable. So it's important to remember that VIT is a serious adverse event and its symptoms seem sort of maddeningly common, but the syndrome itself is relatively rare. So it's vital not just to rule VIT in, so you can quickly start life-saving treatment, but also to rule VIT out, because if a patient doesn't have it, you shouldn't expose them to unnecessary diagnostics and unnecessary treatments. And you should also give them care for what's actually driving their symptoms. Now, we have to be very transparent about this adverse event. We have to be prepared to spot it when it crops up. But we also have to reassure patients and clinicians that not every headache, for example, after vaccination needs aggressive workup and treatment. And, and this is why our guidance really approaches the problem of VIT in three stages. So at the first stage, a patient may present to any healthcare setting, from their family doctor's office to their pharmacy with these sort of nonspecific symptoms. If VIT is suspected on the basis of some very straightforward lab workup, the patient should be moved to an acute care setting for advanced tests and imaging. A presumptive diagnosis should then have specialized confirmatory testing done and should receive empiric treatment. So I'm gonna review all of these steps in turn. The first step in working up VIT is to listen to the patient's story. So though the symptoms seem nonspecific, all reported cases have actually followed a very clear pattern. Cerebral vein thromboses or cerebral sinus vein thromboses have received a lot of media attention, but VIT can actually present with both arterial and venous clots. Now, definitely there's been a preponderance of clots at unusual sites, like in the cerebral veins or, or splanchnic vessels, but 
clinicians should also be aware of what I think are the more pedestrian clots, things like stroke, acute coronary syndrome, acute limb ischemia, pulmonary embolism, and DVT. All of these can be associated with BIT. And the timing is also really important. So as I mentioned, BIT appears to be an immune reaction. And as we all know, from the time of antigen presentation, an antibody-mediated immune reaction actually takes time to rev up. So your symptoms are gonna present four to 28 days post-vaccination. So it's essential to remember that that combination of typical symptoms in a typical time frame should raise your clinical suspicion of VIT and it should push you to investigate things a little bit further. Once VIT is on your radar, what do you do to pursue the diagnosis? How do you move from, from suspicion to a suspected diagnosis? Well, you should focus on some basic workup with high negative predictive value. And again, but the strategy here is that it's important to make the diagnosis of VIT, but since these initial symptoms can be nonspecific, it's also critical to have a safe and effective way of ruling this syndrome out. So the key steps at this early stage, number one, confirm the symptoms. Number two, confirm the timing of presentation of symptoms. That's that, that specific window after vaccination. And finally, draw a complete blood count. Now, if your CBC can be resulted quickly, then we recommend that it can be done in the outpatient setting. Uh, but we know that rapid turnaround time of blood test results isn't always a reasonable expectation. So to move the diagnosis along, the patient can certainly be directed to a more acute care setting. When you get the CBC results back, you should focus on the platelet count. Now the platelet count of reported cases of VIT worldwide has ranged between 10 and 110 times 10 to the ninth per liter. So those of you who are familiar with that analogous condition, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, might wonder, well, was there a drop in the platelet count from the patient's baseline? Well, the reality is we, we don't know how far the platelet count fell from these reported patients' baselines. But at diagnosis, the median platelet count of these VIT patients was approximately 20 to 30. If your patient's platelets are not decreased, we feel this is sufficient to rule VIT out and to work up the patient for other diagnoses that might explain their symptoms. But a low platelet count, and often an impressively low platelet count, keeps that diagnosis in play and it gives your patient the label of suspected VIT. The next step is to focus on more advanced tests, including the D-dimer, the blood film and appropriate imaging. VIT appears to be associated with systemic coagulation activation. So I've described that coagulation storm. During coagulation, fibrinogen is converted to fibrin as clots are laid down. And then that fibrin gets broken down and that cycle of coagulation begins again. The D-dimer is the breakdown product of fibrin. So in VIT, you should see D-dimer elevations generally over 2,000 micrograms per mil, but nearly always over 4,000 micrograms per mil. And again, this is an impressive elevation of the D-dimer. Uh, our Ontario algorithm actually doesn't require any other coagulation testing, but our colleagues worldwide have noticed that the fibrinogen, the PT, and the PTT are also generally decreased as well. We recommend a blood film because it importantly uh, shows what you shouldn't see in VIT. So, so let me explain. In VIT, we only see the thrombocytopenia. We only see low platelets on the blood film. We don't see characteristics of other strongly procoagulant phenomena. So in a VIT patient, you don't expect to see something like red cell fragmentation. If you see that, you should be considering other diagnosis, diagnoses like TTP. Imaging is finally required to diagnose the blood clot, the thrombosis, the sine qua non of the syndrome. Now, I'm not going to review the diagnosis of more usual clots today. Many of you are already familiar with that. So if you have a, a PE or a limb thrombosis or a heart attack, you should work those up just as you would any other patient. But I'm going to make special mention of cerebral vein thrombosis because this can be a very challenging diagnosis uh, to spot. A non-contrast CT brain is a great first step in a patient with a severe headache or focal neurologic symptoms. We certainly order this test frequently in, in my hospital because 
it's pretty specific for ischemia and, and bleeding and even rarer things like masses. But unfortunately, this plain CT is just not sensitive enough to rule out cerebral vein thrombosis, especially when you have a high pretest uh, suspicion. So for example, if you have a suspected VIT, just a plain non-contrast CT is not going to be enough. Now, in this case, to clinch that diagnosis, you may want to do an MRI or an MR venogram. But in most Canadian centers, MR is actually really hard to access quickly. But if you couple your plain CT, your non-contrast CT, with a CT venogram, now you have a rapid and sufficiently accurate option to diagnose cerebral vein thrombosis. The CT and, and CT venogram are certainly not ubiquitously available, but to most Canadian clinicians, they're certainly more accessible than an MR. I'm really grateful um, for the advice of Dr. Thalia Field, who's one of our country's leading stroke neurologists and an expert on CVT. She really highlighted this important clinical pearl for me. Uh, once key diagnostics are done and found to be positive, so when you have the, the high D-dimer, the pretty bland blood film, and you found a clot, now you can make a presumptive diagnosis of it. And then you have to move on to hematology consultation, HIT testing, and some empiric treatment. So let's dig a little deeper into testing before we talk about treatment. So I, I've uh, now several times mentioned HIT, the important disease analog, and that's because like VIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is associated with these anti-PF4 antibodies. And the goal of testing is really to spot these antibodies. In nearly every report of VIT, high levels of antibodies to platelet factor four and a polyanion complex were identified using an ELISA and an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Now, importantly, that, that first step in diagnosis, it must be an enzyme immunoassay. There are many different rapid assays for HIT that use different antigenic targets, but they don't appear to be sensitive enough for the vaccine-associated phenomenon. So they yield false negative results. HIT antibody testing by ELISA is actually really widely available in Canada. Uh, some centers do it in-house, uh, but most centers do a straightforward send-out test. But as clinicians, we don't always know which HIT assay our lab is running. So if you do order this, it's important to ask your lab director, to ask your hematologist or, or pathologist and, and find out and make sure that it is an enzyme immunoassay. Uh, this uh, image is actually taken from an excellent review paper on HIT testing by uh, my colleague, Dr. Ted Workington, who is really the pioneer in, in describing uh, not just HIT, but also vaccine associated thromboses. You can ignore the little swiggles here that represent heparin, but you can see how the patient's serum contains antibodies to PF4, and then it sticks to the microtiter plates and it lights up, and that's your positive result. The HIT ELISA is a highly sensitive screening test for VIT, but we confirm it using a functional assay. And again, this graphic is from that excellent paper on HIT, not VIT, but it still illustrates the point. So when you add a VIT patient's serum to radio-labeled platelets, their antibodies start activating the platelets. It starts turning them on and makes them spit out radio-labeled serotonin, and, and that's when your assay lights up. The serotonin release can actually be enhanced by the addition of even more PF4. Now, the, the clinical pearl for those of us on the front lines here is that IVIG, which is a treatment that I'm going to be talking about in the next slide, actually inhibits that confirmatory serotonin release assay. So when you send this test, make sure that you send it before you infuse the IVIG or you might get a false negative. Now, because testing is just so essential in this diagnosis, uh, the Platelet Immunology Laboratory at, at McMaster, which is truly a world leader, has designed a test requisition to ensure that it is ordered correctly, to facilitate sending in samples. Um, now, we encourage clinicians to take advantage of the local HIT ELISA testing to aid in rapid diagnosis of VIT. You should never wait on these tests before starting treatment. But McMaster's lab is the national reference laboratory in Canada for this condition. I'm very, very grateful to its directors who are also close colleagues and friends, uh, Dr. Ishak Nazi and Dr. Donnie Arnold, as well as their really phenomenal lab staff just for rapidly organizing a coordinated testing strategy around this condition uh, and rolling that out to the entire country.
Now in the algorithm that I showed you, I emphasize the role of hematology consultation once a presumptive diagnosis of VIT is made. So once you have the patient with typical symptoms in a typical time frame with confirmed thrombocytopenia, an elevated D-dimer, and a clot. At this stage, the reason you call a hematologist or thrombosis expert is that we can guide you, not just with organizing testing, but also with initial treatment. And that initial treatment is really two-pronged. First, we anticoagulate the patient. We try to, to uh, get rid of that blood clot and stop it from extending. And second, we try to manage the immune reaction that is really fueling this process. And again, I have to emphasize that early treatment is important. These clots can really be, be devastating. So you have to start the treatment empirically while you're waiting for your testing to come back. And the role of specialist consultation is to guide and support you as you do that. And of course, that consultation can be on site if you do have a hematologist on call for your center, but we are, are always uh, able to support virtually or, or through on-call systems across the country. Now, the key to anticoagulation is to avoid heparin and avoid platelet transfusions because both could theoretically add fuel to that prothrombotic fire. The worry with heparin is that it might enhance antibody-mediated platelet activation. Now, this isn't entirely clear, uh, but because we generally do have options for blood thinners, uh, we suggest avoiding heparin and, and being safe and conservative. Now in Canada, we also realize that there are disparities in how well different places are resourced. That's just our reality. So in Ontario, we suggested that first line anticoagulation be one of the easily accessible direct 10A inhibitors. These are drugs like apixaban, rivaroxaban, or adoxaban. And we have recommended full treatment doses. If the patient is too unstable for oral agents or renal functions impaired, a hematologist or thrombosis physician will guide you around a trickier parenteral anticoagulants, drugs like argatroban. Administration of IVIG is an essential step. It works for two reasons. It likely impedes antibody-mediated clearance of platelets, so it raises up your platelet count, and it impedes platelet activation by blocking platelet FC receptors, so it extinguishes that prothrombotic storm. Now, we recommend a dose of one gram per kilogram um, daily, and two days seems to be sufficient for most reported patients, but if the thrombocytopenia persists, a hematologist will guide you around additional days of dosing. And we have been recommending IVIG for the most severe or life-threatening clots, but our, our understanding is evolving, and we're starting to believe that IVIG is a good choice for all patients with presumptive VIT. Now, whether you diagnose VIT or whether you just have an unrelated thrombosis or a thrombocytopenia after vaccination, it's so essential that you report to public health uh, and, and the regulator. Um, the story of VIT, I, I must emphasize, came to light because of robust vaccine safety and surveillance systems. So it, it's important to continue case finding and continue reporting. And Dr. Salvadori will again uh, address this after my talk. So it's, it's really miraculous to me that VIT was just discovered in March. Uh, we have learned so much in such a short time. There's been so much global scientific cooperation. There are certainly questions that remain though. So for example, where do second line treatments for VIT uh, fit into our treatment algorithms? We are prepared as hematologists to use steroids and to use plasma exchange, but we're are still sort of figuring this out in real time. Extrapolating from other analogous conditions, we do believe this, these would be effective. We also don't know how long VIT antibodies persist, and we don't even know what that persistence means. Should we monitor patients at discharge uh, when they are sent home on anticoagulation? How do we best ensure that they stay safe? And this is also something that is a topic of active discussion. Of course, regulators worldwide have suggested that if you develop VIT with the first dose of AstraZeneca or Shield that you not have a second dose, uh, but the implications of, of this advice and the implementation of it is still being sorted out. And finally, uh, we now have, I believe it's eight credible cases of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia reported in the US after the Janssen uh, vaccine. So we really have to consider the possibility of VIT with other vaccines. There are groups worldwide that are working around the clock on these and, and many, many other questions.
Um, I'm nearing the end of my presentation, but I'm going to leave you with a link at right to some information that you and your patients can refer to if you have questions about BIT. Ontario's Science Advisory Table has produced scientific and lay summaries on this condition, including clinical guides for primary care and emergency medicine clinicians. Our resources are, are continually updated and we're trying to keep up with the flood of information on this condition. I'll leave you with a photo of my hometown, um, Hamilton, Ontario. I thank you for your time today. I thank you for everything you're doing to help uh, your communities. And I will turn it back over to Dr. Salvadori. Um, excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Pai. I appreciate that was clear and so well done. I'd just like to talk to everyone in this call that um, reporting adverse events following immunizations is really critical point, part of our vaccine safety in Canada. Not just if you think that a patient might have a VIT, but actually any event at all. And what's most important is that you just report the event, not that you think that it was caused by the vaccine. So for example, if a patient presents with narcolepsy within six weeks of getting the vaccine, it's fine to report such a thing. We're not going to think that you're saying it's related to the vaccine. This is how we gather information. And that is how rare and unusual events get quickly found. And then we can figure out pathophysiology, we can figure out if they're related. And most importantly, we can make um, uh, efforts to mitigate these adverse events, which we have now done in record time in the world now that we have recognized VIT. Hopefully people will now be aware of it and will be able to recognize it and do what we feel right now is the best therapy. So there's links on here on our um, FAC and, and Health Canada website on how to report any adverse event following immunization. Um, there's a reporting form and there is a user guide to help you fill those things out. And they will that then be reported to us and as well as your local public health and your provincial counterparts um, will be uh, aware of very important serious events in their region. Next slide. Um, also just uh, so that you're aware, you can, then there is a Na NACI statement, which is the National Advisory Committee on Immunization for COVID-19. You can uh, search that on the uh, Health Canada and FAC website, and you can look through different parts. In particular, we will be updating as regularly as we can the vaccine safety and adverse events following immunization. Next slide. And then lastly, you can actually subscribe to the Canadian Immunization Guide updates and NACI updates, and then you will get an email whenever something has changed or when there's an update that you can look at. So now we're happy to take some questions. The first question I'm actually going to take, and then I'll direct the rest of Dr. Pai. The first question a lot of people are asking is just how common is this? And I wanna just state that that's actually a very difficult question for a lot of reasons. First, Many of these bit events were not recognized. It follows about two to three weeks after getting immunized. And then it needs to be worked up and diagnosed. So it's really hard to figure out the denominator. The denominator has to be the number of vaccinations given three or four weeks ago. And as awareness grows and people are diagnosing this, we are finding more that are being reported. So the range of how common this is has been reported all over the world from one in 26,000 in some uh, doses given in Nordic, some Nordic countries, all the way to one in a million in other countries. Um, right now, the European, uh, 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 the European uh, vaccine, or sorry, the European uh, EUA, I'm forgetting right the second what that stands for is the, e, the, it's the European organization that's looking at adverse events related to these vaccines is quoting one per 153,000 doses. So it is a moving target and we don't know, and I would call it a rare but serious event. Now let's ask Dr. Pai, one of the most common questions we're getting, one that I think is very clinically important, there are some recommendations out there that patients um, should take aspirin after getting AstraZeneca vaccine. Can you comment on that, please? 
Yes, I've received lots of, of variations on this question uh, from my own patients. So um, what's important to know about aspirin is that we do not believe that it will help prevent VIT. We also know with, I think, some amount of certainty that it will not actually treat VIT. So aspirin actually blocks um, thromboxane action in platelets. And, and that is an important thing, but that has nothing to do and no effect on that coagulation storm that I've described. I'm also reminding my patients, Dr. Salvadori, that aspirin is an active drug. It has bleeding side effects. So if you're on it for another indication, that's great. Continue it. If you're not on it, please don't start it uh, to prevent something because it's not going to work and it could certainly cause harm. Okay, the next question, are there any risk factors that we know about for this syndrome? Does it matter your age, your sex, or if you have underlying clotting disorders or if you're on birth control pills? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that this question has kind of arisen because uh, many of the early reports of it, they, there was a preponderance of younger uh, women in, in those samples. And, and at first it was thought that could be an association. I will tell uh, you now that we are constantly learning more about these cases and we're digging through all of their past medical histories and their demographics. There do not appear to be any clear risk factors driving this condition. Um, certainly we have had people who uh, are getting it, who weren't on birth control. We're having cases in older folks. We're having cases in men. So no, I don't believe it is, is honest and scientifically accurate to, to give people really anything on, on risk factors at this time. Thank you. Another good question is many of these patients present with a, a headache or a severe headache. If a patient treats themselves with ibuprofen or Tylenol for their headache, Will it mask their symptoms or would, is a headache severe enough that it would persist despite medication? Yeah, great question. And I think this speaks to everybody really wanting to know what they need to monitor for in themselves after making a good decision to get a vaccine. Um, I've treated um, CVTs for many years as a thrombosis doctor, and I'll tell you that the headache is really severe. And uh, you know, standard over-the-counter doses of Tylenol or ibuprofen actually don't make a difference. They will not mask the symptoms. If you're getting those symptoms in the four to 28 day period, um, you should seek medical care. And remember, it's often not just the headache, we are seeing um, reports and we know that CBT presents often with visual symptoms, with seizures, with blurred vision. Um, so this, this isn't your garden variety headache. Um, another excellent question. There are some vaccines that cause an immune thrombocytopenia. How can you tell the difference between VIT and an immune thrombocytopenia? And do they have the same implications? Yeah, the immune thrombocytopenic phenomenon is actually seen with many vaccines, including some non-COVID-19 vaccines. Um, the really big difference is that in immune thrombocytopenia, we'll call that ITP following a vaccination, there is a platelet drop and the patient can experience bleeding. So we tell patients to look out for unusual bruising, unusual bleeding, maybe little red spots on their hands and their feet. However, there's no coagulation storm. So these patients aren't activating their platelets. They're not developing blood clots in other areas. Certainly, if you experience bleeding symptoms or bruising symptoms after a vaccine, you should seek medical care. Your doctor will check you out. They'll do a blood count. But these are not pro-thrombotic conditions. There's not an associated blood clot phenomenon with the standard immune thrombocytopenia. But with VIT, there is. Excellent. Uh, April, how are we doing for time? Or just over. Um, okay. So maybe one yes. more quick question. Okay, well, maybe there, there's been a lot of people asking, um, the question is, is this associated with mRNA vaccines? And so far, a signal has not been seen for VIT with mRNA vaccines, though it is closely being looked for, but so far there has been no signal reported. As you all know, this whole COVID uh, science uh, moves at a, a, an incredible pace. And what we say today may not be the case tomorrow, the next day, but we're trying to bring you as up to date as we can, the information as we know it at the present time.
I'd also like to say Thrombosis Canada has been very helpful and we have a Thrombosis VIT champion in every province. And um, you should always keep with your regular patterns of care. So call your, whoever your local hematologist is, your tertiary care thrombosis specialist, et cetera, in your own region. But there will be people in every region who have volunteered to help answer questions and help direct the laboratory tests, particularly to McMaster, so that we get uh, definitive diagnoses as best we can across the country. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for your time today and most particularly Dr. Pai, Thrombosis Canada, and all of you for the incredibly hard work that you're doing to pull our country through this, uh, the pandemic. And hopefully this is the last really intense and difficult wave. Thank you very much for your time and thank you everyone for participating and most particularly Dr. Pai for her excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you.